Just as biblical law has three dimensions, civil, ceremonial, and moral, it also has three functions, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. The functions of the law ask, how do they operate on you and I? When we hear God's word, when we read God's word, what, what effect, what operation does it have on me, the hearer? All right, so the first use or function is probably the better word. The first function of the law, you can think of as a curb, right? What does a curb on the side of the road do? Well, it's there to kind of keep the cars in bounds because when you go out of bounds, there's consequences both to your vehicle and to whoever or whatever you might hit that is off of the road, right? So the curb is there to keep us in line, to keep us in bounds. And the way God's law does that is it curbs our behavior because there's reward, there's blessing for staying in bounds, and there's curse or consequence for going out of bounds, right? So just imagine a little kid with mom and dad, you know, hey, if you eat all your dinner, then you can have ice cream, all right? So reward for listening. Um, but if you, uh, if you don't eat any of your dinner, then you go to bed hungry, right? This is, this is the only option you have, right? Well, consequence for not keeping the law. And we have this within governing authorities too, right? There, there are tax breaks for certain kind of behavior. And then there are, you know, fees and prison sentences for other kinds of behavior, right? And that is the curb of the law, rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior. Now, the, the thing to understand about the law as a curb is it only has to do with behavior. You can have a person who on the inside really wants to steal. They're just a thief at heart. And maybe they never do steal. Why? Because the law has such a powerful deterrence by threatening bad behavior with very serious consequences that they consider the consequences and they go, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to pay that fine. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to go to jail for that long or just consider speeding. I know some of you are already driving out there on the roads. A lot of people enjoy driving their car really fast. So why don't they drive their car really fast? Because speeding tickets are awful, right? So some people will, will drive by the speed limit for safety reasons. They really don't want to get in a car collision for themselves or for others. Other people will abide by the speed limit, mostly just because they don't want a speeding ticket. Maybe they've gotten a speeding ticket in the past and that kind of cured them of speeding because it was so expensive, the consequences were so dire. That's the curb of the law. It only affects your external behavior. It does not change your heart. And that's something important to understand about the law. The law has no power to make you less of a sinner on the inside. It might make you less of a sinner on the outside with your external behavior, but not on the inside. Only the love of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ can change us on the inside. All right. So the curb of the law, curbing external behavior by rewarding good behavior, giving consequences for bad behavior. All right. The next is the second function of the law. And instead of thinking of this as a curb, Think of it as a mirror, right? Look at the image there. This man is looking at a mirror, but the mirror looks like the Ten Commandments. And that's a good way to think of God's law. God's law reflects who he is. God is good. So everything he expects of us in his law is good and holy and righteous. The law is a reflection of God's character. This is what our Heavenly Father is like. Therefore, this is what his children should reflect. That's what they should be like, right? If you meet the son, if you meet the daughter, you should learn a thing or two about their father. Just based on the character of the son or daughter, you learn a little bit about the character of the father, how the father has taught them. And that's what it should be for you and I, right? All the other animals should be able to look at human beings and go, that's what God is like because that's the creature God made in his image. But the law acts as a mirror, because when we look into the Ten Commandments as a mirror, reflecting back who we are, comparing God our Father to us, what we see is that we are sinners, 
and therefore a very sorry, a very poor, a very pathetic reflection and deed of who our God is, because the image of God in us has been corrupted by sin. So this is the second function of the law, and really the New Testament kind of highlights this, Paul especially in his letters, as the chief function of the law. The law mirrors to us our sinful corruption, that we have sinned and we fall short, very short, of the glory of God. Now, if no one will ever be saved by keeping the law, then why did God give us the law, right? So Paul makes it very clear that no one is saved by works of the law. No one will be justified in God's sight by works of the law, but rather it is by faith in Christ that we are justified. So why the law? Um, And we'll talk about this more probably in chapter 14, second semester, but briefly now, the law is still God's expectation of you even after you're forgiven. Even after you're forgiven of your sin, you are still to go and sin no more. Why? Because of what sin does. Sin is what separated us from God in the first place. Sin is what separates us from our neighbor. Wherever there is offense and a relationship is broken, the offense was caused not by good works, not by love for your neighbor. It was caused by bad. It was caused by evil. It was caused by sin. Sin offends and destroys relationships. So why did God give us the law? That we might not offend him and break our relationship with him. That we might not offend one another and break our relationships with our brothers and sisters. In short, sin is bad for you. It is bad for your neighbor. Sin is bad for your faith. It is bad for your neighbor's faith. And though we have a merciful God who forgives us of all sin, that doesn't change things and suddenly make sin okay. It makes us okay. Our sin isn't going to be held against us. Praise God. But it doesn't make sin okay. In heaven, there will be no sin. In heaven, you and I will all be perfect law keepers. We wouldn't dream of loving God with anything less than all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. We wouldn't dream of loving our neighbor less than ourselves. In heaven, we will do these things naturally, freely. That's part of the reason it's going to be heavenly, right? Um, In heaven, there will be no lawbreakers, right? So the law is good. It is a reflection of who God is. But the law in our current state mirrors to us our lack of goodness, our corruption, our sinfulness. So God gave us the law that we might know what is right and what is wrong in his sight, that we might see that we are sinners, see that we are in deep need of saving. I can't change my own heart to stop desiring sin. Like David, I have to pray, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The Bible says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And this is where it's good to pause and look at a couple passages where Paul speaks of the law in this mirroring function. Let's first look at Galatians 3, and we'll just jump right down probably to, uh, well, yeah, we'll jump right down to, um, Well, is this Romans? Yeah, this is Romans. That's why I'm confused. All right, Galatians 3, and let's just jump right down to verse 23 here, the final paragraph. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian. Um, In the PowerPoint, the translation said schoolmaster. Maybe that's the NIV. I don't know. But the ESV says the law was our guardian. The Greek word is pedagogos. A pedagogos is like the person that you're your wealthy father would hire so that in his absence, you are still getting an education to become a mature man or woman. You are still getting an education to learn all that you need to know about the world and about yourself so that you can be a responsible, mature, functioning adult. Your pedagogos, an educational taskmaster who will make sure you grow up. The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God, sons and daughters through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We wear Christ's righteousness like a robe. In baptism, we put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Whatever divisions that sin created, 
sinful division between Jew and Greek, sinful division between a slave and a free person, sinful division between a man and a woman. Those dividing walls of hostility are broken down when we are all forgiven of our sin and no longer under the guardianship of the law, but adopted into our Heavenly Father's family through Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So here in this chapter, Paul's trying to argue that what the law was never going to be able to do, make us righteous and holy. Why? Because we're sinners. So as people who don't keep the law, we were never going to be righteous and holy through law keeping. We're law breakers. Instead, what the law couldn't do, make us righteous and holy in God's sight, the promise does do. And what's the promise? That one day God would send this offspring of Eve who would defeat the devil, this offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this offspring of David, and this person, Jesus Christ, would be finally the one to restore us to God, to make us the holy, righteous children of God that we were originally designed to be in his image. All right, Romans 7, Paul gets at this same idea. Let's pick up here at verse 7. The law mirrors to us our sinfulness and our need for salvation. What shall we then say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. All right, so notice how the law shows my sinfulness. It shows that sin really is sin. It is not God's good design. I'll pause there in reading Romans 7. So in the second function, the law has this mirroring function. It shows our sin. And when I am shown my sin, and the law does its job convicting me of my sin and calling me to repent of my sin. This is where the gospel comes in to do its job, show our Savior. The law shows me that I need to confess my sins. The gospel shows me that I have a forgiver of sins, Jesus Christ. This is summarized really well in that First John passage. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's the job of the law to show us, no, 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 we are sinners. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the gospel. So the law mirrors my need for saving and the gospel delivers the Savior to me. All right. So the gospel is all things God does through Jesus Christ for my salvation. It offers and it delivers forgiveness of sin. That's the chief function of the law to show us our sin and our need for sal salvation. All right, the third function of the law, this is only for the Christian because the non-Christian doesn't have faith and is still living under this perspective of God as an angry judge. The unbeliever doesn't know that God isn't an angry judge. God is actually a loving father who would forgive you of your sin against him who would actually give you the righteousness he demands of you as a holy judge. He gives you that righteousness in the righteous one, Jesus Christ. But if you don't know Jesus, you still have this view of God as an angry God who demands of you perfection. But for the person who does know Jesus, the law remains also in this third operation, this third function as a guide. Before stuck and enslaved in my sin, right? I'm so self-centered that I can't possibly love God or my neighbor. I was so stuck here. Self-service, self, um, well, selfishness. But once you do have Jesus and you're no longer enslaved to your sin, now you can love God and you can love your neighbor. What does that look like? The law shows us. The law is our guide. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So the law remains to show the Christian what love for God and love for neighbor looks like.